All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Melanie Diesel, who is over in Raleigh, North Carolina. How are you doing, Melanie? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. And normally I'd say you have much better weather, but I think we're yeah, uh, we're fairly balanced. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And Melanie's a key, uh, keynote speaker, author, award-winning branded content creator and author of The Content Fuel Framework, How to Generate Unlimited Story Ideas and Prove It, Exactly How Modern Marketers Earn Trust, co-founder of The Convoy and group ups, B2B marketplaces that have small businesses. And what we're going to talk about today is earning audience trust with content. So it's an interesting subject because um, let's face it, Melanie, you know, content is king and we've heard so much about content and content. And, and then people have been just spewing out content all over the place. Now there's a, now they're using AI tools to spew out even more content. And I've always I've always had that issue is like is number one is is the quality, but also like if everybody's publishing, like who's reading? Mm, well, you know, it's a really a really good question. Um I think when it when it comes to deciding if it's worth you publishing as well, I think my my out my outlook has always been, I'd rather they find my version than someone else's. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the content we create is not going to be sort of the only one out there or like the sing singular resource on a particular topic. Um, but our audience hopefully is paying attention to the stuff that we're creating uh, because I, I really feel like content is one of the best tools to, to earn their trust. Yeah. So t talk to me about that a little bit, because like I said, is I think there's a lot of mediocre and substandard content out there. And I think there's no substitute for quality. And I think that's the first area of uh, of building trust is really is showing that you've actually made some effort and it's not just throwaway content. Yeah, 100 uh, percent. You will hear no argument from me that there's a lot of mediocre content out there. Um, I always like to point out that there's a lot of mediocre everything, too, right? Like there's bad yeah. music, there's bad food, there's bad movies. Um, but certainly with the advent of AI, we're seeing a lot more mediocre content out there. Um, but yeah, the, the quality is absolutely key. So when we're thinking about the kind of content that's going to, you know, bring our audience closer to us, help them see us as experts, help them, you know, believe that we can deliver on our promises, it's going to be the stuff that's of quality that that's worth their time. You know, if, if you're creating uh, poorly written content, no one's going to want to spend time reading it or, you know, poorly edited videos, people probably aren't going to stick around to the end. So quality is definitely uh, that's table stakes for sure. Mm. So if you're advising somebody who wanted to start using content, you know, to, to build a brand, to build trust with an audience, what, what are some of the first steps they should take? So the first step is what I like to call a trust audit, a claim audit. Um, so before you know how to build trust with your audience, you've got to understand first, what is it that I'm claiming to them, right? What is it that I want them to trust me about? I want them to believe. Uh, and I think a lot of us have that. We know that on some level, but it's very rarely documented so explicitly. So, you know, looking through all of your assets, your website, looking through your sales collateral, you know, your in-store signage, if you've got a physical presence and really saying, what are we claiming? What are we promising? What expectations are we setting? Because once you have that list, it becomes a lot easier to say, well, here's the ones that probably could use a bit more backup, or here's the ones we kind of just threw out there and never really provided any additional context about. Mm -hmm. And then, because um, I mean, I feel also sometimes like people don't spend enough time really understanding their audience and what their audience is really interested in and putting it in a voice that, that works for that audience. Because oftentimes you just see, it, it can be great content, but it's aimed the wrong place, right? So it, it kind of goes over the heads or goes under the heads, whichever of the people who are trying to read it. Yeah, I think you're you're totally right. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to, you know, talk to your users, your audience, your customers at every stage. I think we think about it a lot in terms of research, you know, that we're trying to see how our product performs, but it's equally as important in the marketing phase as well as you're coming up with this kind of content, because it's really, I mean, this is the foundation, right? Before we ever get a chance to to speak with them, to have them in store, to, to get them to purchase or join our newsletter. They've got to know who we are and think that we're worth spending 
spending some time with that were trustworthy. Uh, and that is honestly is probably the biggest challenge for most marketers these days. All the data shows that people, consumers in general, are more skeptical than they've ever been. There's, to your point, so much content out there uh, and so many folks who are trying to trick them or deceive them or rip them off. Yeah. So, you know, it's natural for them to be skeptical. It means we got to kind of step our game up a little bit. Uh, and I guess like as well as obviously understanding your audience, you also have to decide on your own voice, right? Because some, cause what I see a lot of times now, and I, I find this is people think, oh, cool and wacky, that's that's where I should go. And you just go, but that doesn't work for your brand. It just looks totally like, it, you know, it just, it's, it's, so, it's grating, right? So I think really understanding or, or taking some time to decide what your voice is and what your voice should be, because we're not all built to be comedians. Yeah, that is true. And it's almost like it's it's worse to try to be funny and not succeed mm -hmm. than to not try at all. That's one of those situations mm -hmm. where you're better. You probably exactly. should hold off. Um, but yeah, I think voice is, voice is definitely important. And that authenticity that you're talking about, you know, not everyone's a comedian. That is a big part of trust as well, because if your audience get a, gets a sense of the fact that you know, I'm, I'm seeing this one brand promise. I'm, they're telling me that they're professionals, that they have a hundred years of experience. But then I look at their social channels and I see dad jokes or, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that. It's like, this is not matching up. And that makes me even more skeptical. Like, is this the right social presence? Is this the same company? Uh, so that kind of consistency of your voice, uh, some of that will come from that claims audit that we talked about. Once you have mm -hmm. a really clear idea, like, Here's who we say we are. Here's what we're promising. Uh, again, it becomes much more easy to look at that list and say, I think this is something we should approach with a teaching voice. We want to be a coach or a guide, or, you know, we need to be uh, an empathetic shoulder to cry on during a tough time. Or, you know, we just need to be the, the super smart experts who can help them out of a jam. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point because I think sometimes because of, because of, content being everywhere and all different types of it and social media and like there's so much content that we're consuming personally as well as professionally and all of that is 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 people start to think that it has to be have high entertainment value when just to your point there which is a really good one is if i'm if i'm looking at a company for something serious and i look at them and say okay these are serious people these know what they're doing well i expect their voice to be serious. I expect their content to be serious, to have real, you know, insight in it. Yeah, it's funny because we would experience that in real life, but I, I think so yeah. often we forget real life when we're in marketing mode. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you went in, let's say you were having a very serious medical procedure and you went into the doctor's office and he came in with a clown nose on and like, you know, <laughs> telling jokes, you'd be like, there's no way I'm going to let this person near me with a sharp <laughs> object. Uh, not a chance, right? Um, that In that environment, you're looking for someone who's who's edging more toward, you know, the, the intellectual side to reassuring you and informing you about the procedure. Now, on the other hand, if you are going like I've got a I've got a toddler, and so when we're looking for a place yeah. for her to get her hair cut, like I'm gonna need some entertainment value. You got You're gonna have yeah. to like make silly voices and faces. Like we're gonna need that kind of that kind of energy for something like that. So it is really important to have that consideration. Like what what is our audience expecting from us, and how can we make sure we're meeting them at that at that expectation? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the other thing too is, is the type of content, the kind of media you use. And then what is it? Are you going to do long form content? Are you going to do short content? Are you going to do a mixture of all of it? But I mean, when you work with people, how do you advise them on a content strategy per se? So one thing that I'm super passionate about uh, is that we have to figure out the story we're trying to tell first before mm -hmm. we figure out the best way to present it. And the analogy I like to give is sort of like we have a package that we want to deliver. Mm -hmm. And we've all had that experience of getting a gigantic box in the mail that has like one tiny thing that you ordered in there and a bunch mm -hmm. of filler. We don't want to have that same experience when we're delivering our message to the customer where we've got to pack it with filler because we put it in the wrong container. Right. So having that clarity first of like, this is the story we're trying to tell. This is the message we're trying to get across. You know, this is the promise we're talking about and the voice we're going to use. Then you can say, okay, well, this is a highly visual story. So it makes sense for us to have photos or video because there's a lot we need to show. Um, or we're talking about a person and we want their, their personality to come through. So maybe video or audio is the place where you can hear their voice and that personality will shine. But once you have that, that clear idea of your story, it becomes a lot easier to decide. 
Yeah, no, I think that's that, that's a great uh, that's a great piece of advice because you could get lost in all the different uh, you know places where you could place your content, and I think that's another part. I mean, once you've figured out what your, your what your story is, who your audience is, and all that is, then selecting the media because sometimes you know people can get sidetracked into oh look TikToks TikTok I need to be on TikTok and you're going well, why do you need to be on TikTok does anybody need to be on TikTok but uh, that's beside the point <laughs> but you know what I mean being 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 careful about going where your audience is as opposed to like chasing the crowd yeah well and I think platform is is another instance where you can be in the wrong place right yeah. so again you know if I'm uh, if I'm looking for, you know, a clown for my child's birthday party or someone to advise me on social media, then, yeah, I want to see you hamming it up on uh, on TikTok. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm probably not looking for the surgeon who's like recording TikTok dances in the operation room because that's going to make mm -hmm. me concerned uh, mm -hmm. about their level of dedication. So, yeah, you got to think about, um, you know, I, we see this exercise in like branding a lot, right? If our brand were a person, mm -hmm. where would it be or what, what platforms would it use? Um, yeah. There's good insight there too, for thinking about where your, where your content should be shared. And then, and then I think the other challenge people have is uh, people think that they need to be self-sufficient, don't they? All the time now they think, I, well, I need to create the content and I need to figure this out instead of like working with people like you or hiring, you know, contract work or people who've done it before. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a huge advantage to that because the trial and error route, I think with it, content has gotten so important and it's so much of it that the trial and error is, is not a good way to go right now. That's going to cost you a lot. Yeah, there's there's a couple things there. I mean, absolutely, you know, we're only human. There's only so much you can do in a day. And uh, yeah. chances are your time is better spent doing the amazing work that you do than, than working on some of this other stuff. So to the degree that you can, using tools to help you with that or services like, you know, Fiverr or some other kind of contract or network uh, is a great way to find other talent. I always remind people that students at your local college or university are also a wealth of experience. They are hungry. They are excited. They are up to date on the new technology and would probably love the opportunity to work with a business uh, and help them create some cool content. But the other thing that I think is really important here is there is this culture uh, in social media and particularly in any sort of like business or marketing space that you have to be everywhere, posting everything six times a day. You got to respond to comments in two minutes or less. Um, it's really important for all of us to acknowledge that the people making those kinds of claims often have a multi-person team just to manage their social media. Um, mm. And that's not a bad thing. But when we look at someone like a, like a Gary Vaynerchuk, who talks a lot about being ever present and creating content everywhere, Gary's got like a 20 person team just to manage his social media. So it's it, we're not all in that same situation. And it's okay to be realistic and say, I can't be everywhere posting every day on everything. So I'm going to choose this one or two or three platforms and really focus my attention so I can make sure I'm delivering quality there rather than being mediocre in a whole bunch of places. Yeah. And that, and that's why, I mean, I think it's a, I, I, I agree with you. And I think it's a mistake to, you know, advocate, just be everywhere, be everywhere every second of the day. Um, because number one, it's unrealistic. And number two is your customers aren't everywhere all the time. I mean, you know, it depends what business you're in, but the chances are, uh, your target customer goes to certain places where you would be better off focusing on. And as we discussed earlier, figuring out what it is they they actually want. Uh, so in, in the case that you're just talking about there, yeah, it's great if you have a huge department, but if not, uh, I think you need to be selective and then, you know, as I said, maybe get some help. Yeah, definitely. So there's a couple of things to consider when you're you're narrowing it down. So you want to think about, first of all, again, where your audience is. That's super important. There's no sense shouting into the void. So make sure you're considering mm -hmm. that. Um, you do want to think about what uh, what gives you energy, what is fun for you, what you have the skills and experience to do. So as an example, I'm I'm a former journalist. So writing will always be sort of my, my content first language. It's the easiest for me to produce and I'm most comfortable. Um, if I were to make a commitment to a big video project, well, that has some skills gaps that I just, it would make it more difficult for me to do consistently, mm -hmm. right? So that's something to consider as well. But when you identify those two things, what you are uniquely positioned to create and where your audience is, when you do find that there's a gap there, that's where you want to be looking to uh, contract help or tools or services that can help you fill that gap. 
Mm-hmm. And the other thing you mentioned too, which is, uh, you know, about this constantly posting, constant, constant, constant. I mean, that isn't applicable to everybody. And I think that's the, that's the point is like, it really has to be applicable to number one, what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to establish and who you're trying to communicate with. And that may, maybe less is better in circumstances like that than more. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it is about understanding your role in the customer's life. Um, I always give the example, you know, there are certain causes or brands that we have an affinity for that we like hearing from them often. I want to know what the next Apple product is that's coming out. You know, I want to know when Starbucks has a new blend of coffee that I need to try or a new seasonal drink. Um, but the company that I buy my, my aluminum foil from or my, you know, paper towels, a lot less desire to hear from them on any sort of regular mm-hmm. basis because their role in my life is very different. The way that, you know, the relationship we have with those brands is different. So that's kind of the challenge, right? Are you an Apple where people want to know what you're up to and you can provide valuable updates that that they want and need? Or is your business in a place where you have fewer communications and they're more meaningful that you don't need to talk to them every day, but maybe what you want to do is focus on the content you can share that's going to be most impactful when they are looking for it. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that in that case, it's just practical advice or something or you know, <clears throat> recipes, how to, right? <laughs> recipes, yeah. How to be, yeah, yeah. Some, stuff, that, stuff that makes sense for your industry, for your business, for your market. Um, what would you say to what, what would you say to people? I mean, I know we can go outside for content and all that, but you say sometimes people go, well, like, I, I, I have nothing to say. I, I can't create content. I don't know what, I, you know, I have nothing. Oh, man, this breaks my heart. That's the worst, I think, because, you know, uh, there's so many studies that show, and I'm sure folks have heard this, that when we're kids, we are so creative, right? We -hmm. are uninhibited. You know, my daughter right now is telling me she wants to be a fire truck when she grows up, not a firefighter, but a fire truck. Like, like that's that's creative, right? There's no limits to the things that we, we think of and we share. And then as we get older, you know, we get sort of jaded, you get shut down. That's not, you can't be that. You can't do that. That's not how it works. And we kind of stop exercising those muscles. But the reality is that we are all creative. Everyone has this intuitively within them. And that more often than not, it's about understanding how to access it, that it's just a muscle we haven't been flexing and we need some sort of prompt or system or framework to consistently access that creativity because it's still in there. We've just sort of shoved it down to avoid getting our feelings hurt when we say we want to be a fire truck. Yeah. And isn't it funny though, when somebody says like, oh, I can't create, that's just not me. I don't have anything. And then you just have a casual conversation with them and you get them to the point where they start telling a story and they tell you a story and then you just go, Hey, you just, that's fantastic content. Why don't you just like record that? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's one of the things where, again, finding someone who can support you in your content is a really, it can be a really helpful thing. Mm -hmm. You may not feel comfortable writing, you know, again, I don't write, I'm not a, I'm not a writer. I don't feel comfortable writing this blog, but perhaps finding someone who writes, who can interview you, who can ask you questions Mm -hmm. and pull out that information and create it for you. Um, It's not unlike having a ghostwriter, right? That many, many authors, they have great ideas, but writing may not be their first, you know, instinct on how to deliver it. So totally okay to use third party logistics to get your idea uh, to its final destination. Absolutely. And just one, one, one final uh, question here. So as Google and the others, you know, use, they're trying to put in algorithms to get high quality content, original content, all of that. So just those of you who are having fun with the AI tools, uh, just, just a a word of warning. It's probably going to come back to bite you very soon. Uh, So with all of this, where do you see the future of content going? Is it going to be more and more and more about quality? I think there's going to, there's two things we need to be on the lookout for. Um, As uh, quantity is no longer important, it hasn't been for quite some time, but I do think that uh, all the, the proliferation of all these AI tools is going to kind of make people believe that again. So I think we'll see a spike as folks start to say, well, now I can create three blogs a day and they just kind of get overzealous. Right. So I think we'll see that. And then the pendulum of reality will swing back a little bit. Um, But I do think that, For those who, those content creators who are willing to play with these tools and learn how they can be helpful, it will make their existing process faster, easier, more efficient, more accurate. Um, Obviously, with any tool, it's about the person using it, right? Um, Mm -hmm. A hammer in and of itself doesn't accomplish much or a camera. It's it's about who's who's handling. So uh, it's something that I would encourage any content creator to at least be exploring. You want to understand how it works so that you can identify ways for it to help your process. 
Yeah, fantastic. Um, listen, Melanie, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of uh, Melanie's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Absolutely. So I am really passionate about helping people unlock their creativity. You heard my reaction to the I'm not creative. Uh, so that's kind of my life's mission. Uh, I'm a former journalist. And what I do is, is take that experience and try to help people understand how they can use those systems to unlock their creativity, to have more divergent thinking, come up with more unique ideas. And I do that through my books that are uh, behind me here. You can learn more about mm -hmm. in those links. Um, and I also do a, a lot of speaking workshops, uh, facilitation, just trying to help people unlock their creative potential. Yeah, fantastic. Listen, thanks again, Melly. I, I encourage you to go check it out because the content the content wars are only really beginning, I think, now. So, uh, you know, it, it would serve you well. It would behoove you to, to check out some people like Melanie and see if you can get ahead of this. So, listen, thank you again, Melanie. Thank you for yeah. watching and listening. See you all again soon.